Can you hear me now? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about anything so far? All right, so I'm just gonna carry on. So hopefully you can see the PowerPoint slides and uh, we're gonna start into chapter six and then just remember you guys uh, need to take your exam for chapters one through five by tomorrow at midnight. You need to complete it by then. So I would start it no later than 1030. Uh, all right. So the next chapter, this will be on your second test. Um, and it's basically just a tour of the, the cell itself. So we talked about that the cell is, you know, the cell theory says that all living things are made out of cells. We know that the cell is the smallest unit uh, that can actually uh, do all the things that we said were required for life, such as order, um, evolution, growth and development, and all, that whole list. And hopefully you guys know that list for the exam. So we're just gonna delve into uh, what makes up a cell and what's inside a cell and what the cell's role is. So we've, we've already done this and you should guys should know this for the first exam that Robert Hooke was the first one to name and describe cells. And I'm 99% sure you're going to see that on the test. Remember, you don't need dates. You don't need to memorize dates, but I, I put them in there so you can kind of get an idea of how long ago this was. So we're talking, you know, a little over uh, 350 or so years ago was the first time that anyone saw anything um, on anything that was not bigger than what the human eye could see. Um, and so he used a compound scope and remember that has two lenses and one is the, the ocular lens, which is the closest one to your eye. So over here, there's a lens and then the objective, which is closest to the object, which is right here. So that's why it's a compound. It has two lenses. And most modern microscopes have this. Remember Leeuwen hook, his was simple. So he had one lens right in the middle. And that's like a magnifying glass. And the problem with that is things get distorted as you magnify them. If you've ever used a magnifying glass, you've probably experienced that. So the light uh, is focused using a condenser um, and then that light passes. So this is, a, this is a Hook's one. They used an oil lamp. Today we would use electricity, a light bulb. And then it, the, it would focus the light in a, using a water flask that would actually make the light sort of focus like a, more like a laser uh, or a spotlight and it would shine on the specimen. So generally in today's microscopes, the light emits from underneath, but you can also do it this way as well. Um, so the light is refracted. That means it's bent with the, in the, lens, the two lenses, the ocular and the objective, and that allows it to magnify. So the objective lens has a magnification and sometimes, you know, you, the standard magnification for the objectives is four X, and then we have a 10x, and usually we have a, a, a 40x, and then a 100x. And that's the magnification power of the objective. This is also has magnification power, and generally this is 10x. So to figure out magnification, you just multiply the two lenses together. So if you're on this objective, it would be 40 times magnification. If you're on this objective, can you guys tell me what that would be? Right, well, 10 times 10 is oh, sorry. 100. And then if we did 10 times 40, that would be 400x. And then the last one would be 1000x. There's a reason that microscopes, light microscopes, the ones that use light, right? Because light is a wave. 
it's also a particle, but we're concerned about the waves. And so they have a wavelength, which is the distance from the crest to the crest or the trough to the trough. And that wavelength, you can only pass so many waves through a specific space. And because of this wavelength, the size of this wave, we can only get so much light through here um, and still maintain a sharp image, what we call resolution. So this 1000X is the maximum magnification that you can get with a light microscope and still maintain what we call resolution. You can, I mean, they sell microscopes that go to 1200X at, you know, Fry's Electronics, I've seen them, but this would not be a clear image. This would be a little blurry, um, just like a magnifying glass, because you can't maintain resolution uh, going that to that high of a magnification. It's simply not possible because of the laws of physics. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so important things about microscopy, uh, magnification is the ratio of the object image to its real size. So uh, 100x would mean that, that we're magnifying it 100 times its actual size. 1000x would be 1000 times its actual size. Resolution is different. Resolution is the minimum distance between two points that can be distinguished. It's real simple. If I drew, if, if I drew two points at the end of a football field, you might be able to distinguish those two from each other. But if I drew them like this, then you might not, you might think that that's just one dot because you can't see, you don't have the resolution to distinguish that as two dots. You know, uh, it's similar to what you would experience in a television. You guys are familiar with like, you know, HD, which is 1080, uh, 10, sorry, 1080 resolution or uh, 4K, which is, um, what is it, 40, 86 and then they have 8k so like that and, and back in the day they had uh 480 pixels and you you probably can tell a difference between the resolution of these televisions and it has to do with you being able to distinguish one pixel from another and you'd notice that as we get lower resolution of televisions like down to 480 they seem to be more blurry because they don't they don't distinguish between those two dots. So that's what resolution is. And we talked about that resolution is limited by wavelengths of light. And it turns out that, you know, if we're going to get down to the nitty gritty of it, the, the limit of resolution of a light microscope is 0.2 micrometers. So um, for the metric system, you guys should know that micro is that symbol mu um, because milli is actually m and we can't use the same symbol for the for both. So we use the Greek symbol mu and that if you remember, we have the meter and then we have our, our line and then two spaces. <coughs> excuse me, two decimal places is um, centimeters, and then we have millimeters, and then three more decimal places down from that is micrometers. So if we had one meter and we were converting it to micrometers, we would need to move the decimal one, two, three, four, five, six places, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that would, and then we fill it in. And so a micrometer is one, because we're going from micro to milli, so we go the opposite way, one millionth of a meter. 
So we went from here, we needed to move the decimal this way. Um, and, and because of that, because of this resolution, the length of the waves, the 1000X is the maximum magnification possible while maintaining resolution. And that gets us down to looking at things that are the size of bacteria and maybe some of the larger specialized structures in a cell like the nucleus that we've already talked about and there are others and we're going to cover those in this chapter okay so a couple important things resolution is inversely related to wavelength that means as wavelength the size of the wave goes down shorter waves you get greater resolution so uh waves this gets small resolution gets big and that's what we mean by inversely uh proportional or inversely related um, if they were directly related then as the resolution got small wavelength would get small or if wave, uh, resolution was big wavelength would be big so we can we can improve our resolution but we can't use light because it takes up waves. So the only way to make uh, the resolution and magnification increase is to decrease wavelengths. Now it turns out we can use electrons for that. We can use electron beams. They're, they're on the scale of nanometers. So again, if we go back to that line that we did, we have uh, the meter and then we have three, I'm gonna skip centimeter and we have millimeter we have one, two, three. We have the micrometer. And then we have one, two, three. And then we have nanometer. So if we had one nanometer wavelength, we would need to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places. And then we just fill it in with the missing zeros. And so you would see that this is one trillionth. Um, I'm sorry, one billionth of a meter, 10 to the minus ninth, because we're moving nine spots. And so that's about a thousand times bigger than light microscopes, because we talked about light microscopes are 0.2 micrometers. And remember, a nano is a thousand times smaller. And that means that we can increase our magnification by about a thousand times. So we had a thousand X for light, and then we increase it another thousand X for electrons. And that gives us a million magnification. So we can get up to a million magnification using electron microscopes. And that's near the maximum magnification possible. At this level, we can look at viruses that are very small, some uh, larger proteins, and even some small molecules. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so there are other microscopes. Um, there are uh, uh, microscopes called atomic force microscopes. They have uh, three of these at ASU. And they're in the biodesign building. The I don't know if you guys have been to ASU campus or you know anything about it, but you can look this up. And biodesign, um, before I went to ASU before they had finished building biodesign. Um, it was a big influx of funds to do biotechnology um, and and really high-end biotechnology. So it has like iris scanners to get into the building because they have, they use biosafety level three and four things. So they're working on viruses like smallpox and bacteria like anthrax in there. And they don't just want anyone to go in and out. But as part of the build of this uh, biodesign was that they had they they built a building and they dug about 20 meters into the bedrock. So that's about 60 feet, the, about six stories into the bedrock, uh, and to house these atomic force microscopes because they're super sensitive to any 
movement, any swaying. So they had to really anchor the buildings. And so the buildings were actually designed around these atomic force microscopes. And not only that, but they had to, so the, let's say that this is the atomic force microscope, it's in the basement. They had to insulate everything because it's real sensitive to uh, uh, static. Even the elevators are specially designed to, to not interfere with these microscopes. And the way they work is they work like a, like a record player. So they have a long arm, then they have a needle on the end that's down, whittled down to the width of one carbon atom. And then there's a sort of a pivot here. And so any small change on this end has a big change over here. And basically what they're doing is they're dragging it. So let's say that this is a hydrogen atom. They're dragging this carbon atom across it. And this, this moves up and down based on the shape of it. Or, and they can do that for molecules too. And it literally draws out the shape of these things. So with this atomic force microscope, you can actually look at things as small as atoms here, but these are, you know, several million dollars and require lots of construction planning. So they're not very common, but we, but we can get down to that level using different technology. Okay. So for, I've just told you that, but you don't need to know that for the test. It's just a, a bit of trivia. Um, so you don't need to know all of these numbers either. Uh, what you should take away from this lecture is the difference between magnification and resolution. And you should know that the, the, lim the limitation for light microscopes is uh, the wavelength of light. So I might ask you that. Um, I'm not, I won't ask you, I'm, I'm not going to ask you this. I will ask you what's the mag maximum magnification possible. So you need to know it's a thousand X. You need to know uh, the resolution is limited by the wavelength of light. You need to know the definition of magnification and the definition of resolution. And you should get an idea of what, what you can use the light microscope for. Because let's face it, when you guys uh, become scientists or uh, medical personnel and you wanna observe a virus, like COVID uh, using a light microscope, you're not gonna be able to see it. Why? Because it doesn't go down that small. If it was a bacteria, yeah. So you might look kind of dumb if you're trying to use a light microscope to look at a virus. Um, but you could use a light microscope to look at bacteria and some of the internal structures of the cell. What would you need to look need to use to look at the structure of COVID-19? If I ask you on the test, what kind of microscope? Electron. Yeah, you need an electron microscope. You couldn't use a light microscope. So that's the purpose that you need to know that. So electron microscope, you should know that electron beams have shorter wavelengths, so we can increase this magnification to about a million X. You should know that. Um, you don't need to know this. It's not that's not critical. I'm just telling you, the wavelength dictates the magnification, um, and that we can look at things that are even smaller than bacteria, like viruses and proteins and small molecules, right? Um, so that's what you should get out of this. And this is just a scale. You don't need to memorize the scale. I'm not. I'm just showing you a reference, right? So. With your naked eye, you can see down to about here. So you could see frog eggs. You, you know, you've probably seen them before. They turn into tadpoles. Um, with the light microscope, you can see from here to about here. So there are bacteria that are really, really small. And so, you know, in some instances, you wouldn't be able to use a light microscope to see the very smallest bacteria. But most of the time, this is the general size of of, this is a prokaryote, <coughs> and then this is a eukaryote. So most plant and animal cells, most bacteria, we're going to talk about mitochondria. They make, they make your energy, they make ATP, the majority of it, not all of it. 
Um, and then if we want to look at viruses, we're going to need an electron microscope because light microscopes aren't very useful for that level. And then we can go all the way down almost to atoms. And then if you wanted to look at atoms, I'm just telling you that you can, you don't need to memorize it, but you can use that atomic force microscope to look at atoms. But electron microscopes can get pretty close to the atom scale. Um, so I'm not going to ask you anything about this. It's just simply for reference so you get an idea of what microscope you should use when studying certain things. And I already sort of outlined what I want you to know here. So electron microscope, viruses, proteins, and small molecules, um, regular microscopes, bacteria, and some organelles. So that's what you should know. <coughs> All right, there's different types of electron microscopes. We have uh, a microscope called transmission electron microscopes. Transmission basically means that they're transmitting electrons through the sample. So let's say that you had a tumor. I'll just draw a cancer tumor. And your surgeon would might remove this uh, tumor. And then what the scientist would do is take that tumor and embed it in a piece of what we call paraffin. Uh, basically, it's wax. It's hard wax. And then once it's embedded in this paraffin, uh, we we take a, an instrument called a micro. What's micro mean? You guys should know this because we learned it. It's small, small 10 to the negative sixth, right? And then tome. So remember, I talked about the word anatomy. What does tomey mean? Do you remember? Anna means up, and tomey means to cut. So what do you think a microtome is? Small cut. Yeah, so it, it takes, it actually makes razor thin slices of this and then it falls into uh, uh, water. And the reason it can do that is the water has this property that, uh, that uh, allows things to float on it. And what do we call that? Surface tension. Right. So um, then scientists take this and they coat it with uh, like a heavy metal, like gold or silver, kind of like uh, spray painting it. And then, uh, you know, as you go through here, you're going to take slices of the cell. And because you're slicing it, you can see inside the cell. So this, these cells are cells that are found in your intestines. So if we're looking at your guts, you have your small intestines and your large intestines and they weave around like so. And so as your food moves through here, so this would be food, these little things are called cilia. They beat like little oars in a boat to move your food through your small intestines. And as that happens, it also is extracting the nutrients sugar and things like that across these gap junctions into your blood. So that's how you get your nutrients. And this is a cross section of the cells. So you, I want you to notice here that you can see inside the cell, right? So one of the challenges of making the COVID vaccine is that, okay, you made an mRNA vaccine so how do you get the mRNA into a cell? And how do you verify that the mRNA is actually going into the cell? Well, what they did was they took the mRNA, the messenger RNA for that spike protein. And remember uh, the, the DNA is turned into RNA and that's turned into protein. And you should know this for this test. That's the central dogma. And they coated it with a lipid 
a phospholipid, which is the same lipids that your cell membrane is made out of. And we, we covered this in chapter five. So whenever this encounters a cell, it fuses with it kind of like two bubbles. Uh, if you've ever seen two bubbles can make one big bubble. So this fuses and then the mRNA ends up on the inside of the cell. And that's how the vaccine is delivered to the cells. And then your body takes this mRNA, even though it's from a virus, and makes the spike protein. And that floats around in your bloodstream where your B cells, your antibody making cells, recognize that as a foreign protein and they start generating antibodies to it. And that's how you get immunity to, to <coughs> COVID-19. Uh, this is the, the Pfizer vaccine. All right. So the reason I'm telling you all this is because if you're a scientist and you're, and you're making this vaccine and you, and you're trying to get money from the government to show that your method works, you're going to need to show that the mRNA is getting inside the cell because if it doesn't get in the cell, there's nothing to turn that RNA into protein. So you would need to use a microscope that you could see, you know, and you can tag this mRNA with the, with the green dye from a jellyfish or whatever. You don't want to see it inside the cell. And to do that, you would need a transmission electron microscope because nothing, a light microscope couldn't see an mRNA, but this could. So TM uh, you have used thin cross sections, slices of a specimen. They're stained with metal particles, just like I explained. And the electrons are transmitted through. So I underlined this for a reason. The specimen, so that you can see the internal structures of the cell, right? So high resolution internal structures. You can recognize the images because they usually look like 2D images. Uh, which is what this is. So this is a slice, a cross section of a cell that's lined your small intestine. Now that's different than a scanning electron microscope. This is the exact same image of the exact same cells that we just saw in that last slide. These, this is the, those little uh, things that are projecting out we call cilia. It's these things right here exact same cells, except this image is different, right? In this image, you can't see inside the cell. You can only see outside of the cell. So a scanning electron microscope basically takes the whole tissue section. Like, let's say it's these part of the intestines. We don't slice it. We just spray it again, spray with the, with a, a metal. Uh, it could be gold or lead or something like that. <clears throat> Metal particles, and it's only good for looking at the surface. So on the test, I might ask you, uh, you want to see, you want to, let's say that you're making insulin. You're making an artificial insulin that's going to be better than uh, regular human insulin at regulating blood sugar levels. And on the surface of these cells are receptors on the outside. And you want to prove to your uh, donors, whoever's funding your project, that your insulin is binding to the surface of the cell. What kind of microscope would you want to use for that? SEM. Yeah, you would want to use an SEM because you can see the outside of the cell, right? Now, if I wanted to know if my insulin, insulin doesn't do this, but let's just pretend that, that insulin would go into the cell and you wanted to prove that the insulin is binding and then it's going into the cell, what kind of microscope would you use to show it inside the cell? EEM. Yeah, transmission electron microscope. So that's the difference, right? You wanna use, you wanna know that I'm teaching you the tools that you can use in order to observe what you wanna observe. All right. So normally in labs, we would do this. Uh, we usually take peas and we grind them up. And we fractionate them. So 
I mean, in, in lab, you know, it's not really that exciting to fractionate peas, but this is used all the time. So for example, there's a recent cancer drug um, and it was discovered because a scientist was looking at uh, tumors and what he noticed was, is that every time he saw a tumor, it was real veiny. It had a lot of blood vessels going into it. And that makes sense, right? Because if you didn't have blood flow, you couldn't feed and deliver oxygen to that cancer tumor. And so he sort of reasoned, his name was Salk, by the way. And he kind of reasoned, you don't need to know it, that uh, these blood vessels, the, the tumor was somehow getting recruiting these blood vessels to feed it. Um, so uh, just a little a quick overview of cancer. So cancer is initially caused by uncontrolled cell growth. So you might, you have cells. Cells uh, usually know that they have neighbors and they'll stop dividing, but cancer cells don't, uh, that mechanism is broken. And so you have these uncontrolled cell growth and, you know, uh, and we call that a tumor. In, in uh, a normal world, like not scientists, uh, you might call this uh, benign. And benign simply means that it hasn't moved from its original origin. And if you were a skilled surgeon, you could just cut this out and throw it away and it's no big deal. It wouldn't hurt anyone. What, what happens is, is that these things start losing their way and they get in the bloodstream. So let's say that this is lung cancer, you know, and they could go in your lungs and cut that out. It would be a delicate operation, but if they can transplant someone's face, they can remove a lung tumor. And this would then spread into your bloodstream and then, and then maybe it goes to your brain. And now you have lung cells in your brain. Well, lung cells aren't going to help your brain think because they have a job and that is to transfer oxygen and exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if lung cells get in your brain, they start interfering with your brain cells. So they get in between them and it would be very similar to someone ramming an ice pick into your head because that is the same sort of effect that an ice pick would have is sort of interfering with the connections, the neural connections of the brain. And eventually you would die because of that. You know, imagine if someone jabbed the ice pick in your head several times. Um, it's not, that's not good. So it's creating disorder. And we said in the first chapter that order is required for life. So um, we call this metastasis. And even if a, a tumor moved into your brain it wouldn't be able to divide very long if it couldn't get nutrients, if it couldn't recruit uh, blood flow to itself. So we call that angiogenesis. You don't need to know this. Um, angio's blood and genesis it means creation, right? So it's creating blood vessels. And that's what Salk recognized. So he postulated that there's something in these tumors that are recruiting blood vessels, and he started looking for a protein that would stop this effect. And how he started was he would, he looked at uh, mammals and he looked at different body type parts. And what he realized is that in cartilage, there's very little to no blood flow. So um, he went to the local butcher shop and got some uh, cows uh, cartilage from their knees and he put that, the cow's cartilage in a blender and chopped it up just like this. And we call it homogenizing. And so we've got this ground up cow cartilage and then he started separating it. So he separated it in a centrifuge uh, 800 times the force of gravity for 10 minutes and you get these two layers. One is called a pellet and the liquid on top is called the supernatant. So you guys need to know when you spin a centrifuge, you're always gonna get these two layers if you spin it fast enough. You're always gonna get a liquid on top, which we call the supernatant, 
and the solid on the bottom, which we call a pellet. And so if you poured off the liquid and spun it even faster, you get another pellet and then you poured that off and you spun it even faster. So now we're talking about 10,000 times the force of gravity. And then you poured the liquid off and spun it even faster. Every one of these, you're gonna get a different pellet. <clears throat> and the way this works is, and you probably can imagine, right? What do you think goes to the bottom as a solid? The things that are heavier or the things that are lighter? Heavier. Heavier, yeah. And so what you're doing is you're fractionating different things based on their mass. And that, you know, this is gonna be less mass as we go faster and faster and faster. So this is gonna be heavier than this and this and this and so on. And so he spent seven years fractionating things till he got them down to each individual protein. So he had like 25,000 fractions of proteins. And then he finally discovered one protein that would inhibit blood vessel growth. And this is actually uh, being used to treat cancer patients today. And in some instances, it will put their cancer into remission because if cancer can't get blood, it can't eat, it can't breathe, and it dies. So this is a really important process that scientists go through to discover new drugs and, and you know, painkillers and all kinds of other stuff and how things work. And in biology, we, we do this in a general way so that we can look at different organelles, different small enclosed regions and cells and figure out what their function is. So that's how we figured out everything that we're gonna talk about next. All right, <clears throat> so just to remind you, prokaryotic cells are only found in bacteria and archaeobacteria. So we could expand this to be eubacteria because I told you that's the true bacteria. And these are the ancient bacteria that live in, you know, really extreme environments. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. That's what prokaryote means. Pro is before, karyote is nucleus. Um, it has DNA. All living things have DNA, right? Except viruses. And we didn't really say if they're alive or not. And they're just in an area. They're just out there. <clears throat> the DNA is out there. It's not in a nucleus. It's not membrane bound. And there are no membrane bound organelles. When we say membrane, we're talking about phospho lipids, which we talked about in chapter five. So remember that phospholipid bilayer that all membranes are made out of? Well, all these organelles, uh, if they have a membrane, they're also made up of phospholipid bilayer, just like the outside of the cell. And then we talked about all prokaryotes have a cell wall, not all eukaryotes do. Um, we'll talk about ribosomes in a second, but these are the these are the workers that make proteins. You guys know about the plasma membrane, so that's the phospholipid bilayer membrane that allows for what biological process? Why do we have a membrane? What's that fancy word we learned in chapter one? Homeostasis. Yeah, homeostasis. Good. It's the word of the day. Try to use it in a sentence. All right. And then we have a capsule uh, that's kind of a gelatinous coat that uh, protects the bacteria from uh, your immune system and stuff like that. Pili are things that they use for conjugation, which is basically bacteria sex. Um, usually bacteria produce asexually, but they can uh, when we're talking about sexually, we're talking about trans, you know, uh, two different cells of DNA coming together and transferring their DNA. And then we have a uh, flagella that help them move. And we'll talk about this. We're going to talk about uh, flagella later on in this chapter. Okay. So this is. This is a typical eukaryotic cell. These are those uh, microvilla that I just showed you in uh, your cells of your small intestines. 
Um, we have the nucleus. And inside the nucleus is the DNA. And remember, you have about 35 stories worth of DNA. If you were in a book enclosed in this nucleus. Uh, we'll talk about the nuclear envelope. It's the membrane that, that surrounds the nucleus. And then there's a region in there called the nucleolus. Um, and then we'll talk about chromatin, which are the proteins plus the DNA that make chromosomes. Um, right outside the nucleus, we have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is shown here in blue. Um, we call it the ER for short, and there is a rough ER and a smooth ER. Pointing here. Um, some eukaryotes have flagella. Uh, a good example of this would be sperm in humans. Um, we're not going to talk about peroxisomes, so you can you don't need to know that. Uh, we will talk about a centrosome. This is what's used, and we'll we're not going to talk about this until chapter uh, twelve. But this is what's used to move the chromosomes around. So that's really important. Um, the lysosome is like the stomach of the cell. So its job is to digest things, just like your stomach. And so does your stomach have a high or low pH? High. Um, so uh, if you go back your the pH of your stomach is about two. And so that number is low, even though it has a lot of hydrogens in it. So the lysosome actually has a low pH too. Its pH is about five, as opposed to the rest of the cell, which is about 7.2 to 7.6. Um, mitochondria, so these are organelles that are right here and there they make ATP, that's their job. <coughs> We talked about the plasma membrane already. So that's the phospholipid bilayer that allows for homeostasis. And then right outside of the ER is a thing called the Golgi. And the Golgi's job is sort of like a shipping center, like a UPS sorting center. So I don't, I don't know if you know this, but when I was going to ASU and getting my PhD, um, I also worked part-time for FedEx uh, in Tempe. And so we would we would get packages of, from that people dropped off at FedEx facilities uh, from all over the place, and then we would sort them, and then send them out to central hubs. One of those is in Atlanta uh, for the East Coast, and then uh, they would send it to uh, LA on the West Coast, uh, and then from there they would send it to smaller places. So your uh, nucleus is making mRNA, right? And that mRNA has got to get turned into a protein. And so it's basically like making a package and trying to ship it out. Well, where does that package go? Does it go to the ER or does it go uh, out into the cytoplasm C? And once that package is delivered and it's turned into protein, is that supposed to go out of the cell? Is it supposed to go to the mitochondria? Is it supposed to go to the, the lysosome? You know, so there's a lot of shipping going on around inside the cell. And the Golgi's job is to sort of be that sorting center where it, you know, put the, it's, you know, will scan it. It might add a sugar to it. And if we add a sugar to it, then it, be called, it becomes a glycoprotein. Or it might add a fat to it. And if it adds a fat to it, what do you think we call it? A protein that has a fat attached to it. It's called a lipoprotein, which is the same thing that they've told you is cholesterol, right? Like low density lipoprotein. So it's really a protein with a fat attached to it. It's not cholesterol because 
there's no protein in cholesterol. So that's just sort of an overview and we're gonna go over each one of these right now. Um, what's not found in animal cells are chloroplasts. This is the site of photosynthesis. There's not a central vacuole. Um, usually this word plast tells you it's from a plant. So if you see plast, that's a, usually in a, only found in plant cells. All right. So this slide, it, um, it's kind of busy, but what the point of this is to tell you that you guys know that, that cells are generally small, right? That's why we need a microscope to observe them. So the question you probably you might want to ask yourself as a good scientist is why? Why do cells have to be so small? And it really has to do with the surface to volume ratio. So when you're a cell, you need a specific amount of gas exchange. You need oxygen, you need nutrients, you need food, you know, you need to be able to make energy. And so as the cell gets bigger, it's a lot hard, the, the surface area doesn't get as big as the volume. And that's what this is showing you here, right? So we have the surface area here is not much bigger. Uh, Than, than here, as opposed to the volume, which doesn't change much. So the surface area is getting much bigger and the ratio is much smaller as the cell grows. And so you can't do gas exchange or nutrient exchange efficiently. And this would cause the cell to, the inner part of the cell to die to not function properly. And eventually, because the cell is one unit, the whole thing would die. <clears throat> and that's why you don't see giant cells walking around like uh, uh, when you, you see in these B-horror movies. And there's also a... a, a, a cells can only be so small because they need room to do work. Imagine if you were trying to build a car in a, a telephone booth. You wouldn't really be able to do that because you wouldn't have room to get to assemble all the parts. So as the cell gets smaller, there's less room to do work. It's like how many people can you shove into a Volkswagen? Um, so there's an upper limit to how big a cell can be and a lower limit to how small cells can be. And what I want you to take away from this is the upper limit is due to the surface, the surface to volume ratio. That's really all you need to take out of this. Surface to volume ratio uh, is the upper limit and the lower limit is uh, it won't, wouldn't be able to function. It needs room to do things. So that's that's why cells are in this real weird uh, size region. All right, any questions so far? Okay, so we're gonna specifically talk about eukaryotes here because prokaryotes don't have internal membranes. So we have DNA. DNA is the biggest organelle. It takes up the most space because you, you have 3.15 billion letters of instruction in here and that takes space. Uh, it's a giant library. It's amazing that it can fit in this uh, inside of the a cell that you can't see with the naked eye, but it does. Uh, it's a very complicated feat that allows that to happen, but you want to protect the DNA from things outside of the nucleus that are meant to destroy DNA, namely, you know, viruses that come in. So foreign DNA, 
would have to enter to the outside of your cell. And so you have these sentinels called DNAs, they're enzymes looking for DNA to destroy. If you didn't have a membrane around your DNA, in other words, if this was open, not that open, and you had this DNA, it would go into your nucleus and what would happen to your DNA? This thing destroys DNA. So what would happen to your DNA? It would chop it up and then that's the only copy that's the only cookbook you have to make you or to make this cell so what would happen to the cell it would die yeah it would die so it's really important that you have you maintain this membrane to keep the dna dna and any other riffraff out of your nucleus Remember, we talked about if you have the only copy of the Mona Lisa, you want to put that behind, you know, a barricade and a special frame guarded by, you know, French guards. Uh, you don't want just any riffraff over there messing around with your painting. Uh, so that's the reason for these compartments. And then the lysosome, you know, we talked about that's the stomach. So lysosome. Remember, it has to have a low pH. This has to have a pH of five. And out here, the pH is about 7.2. Would you be able to have a different pH if the lysosome wasn't enclosed? No. Uh, and the, the answer would be no. It would just be like the same as if I removed all the walls of your house or apartment, what temperature would it be? Same as outside, right? You wouldn't be able to maintain something different. You wouldn't be able to cool or heat your house um, if you didn't have walls around it. So this pH is allowed to be different only because of this membrane. If I opened it up, these two would mix together and you'd end up with something in between, like 6.1 or something like that. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So we can partition the cell into compartments so that we have unique proteins and lipids inside each of these, right? So the lysosome has DNAs and RNAs and proteases, and their job is to do hydrolysis reactions. So to bring in water to chop up DNA and RNA and protein, and that has lipases and that job is to chop up lipids. So this thing is really nasty. Like you wouldn't want this open and I'll have all these enzymes running around because what would happen to all your whole cell? It would destroy it. Like it would remove all the lipids and you wouldn't be able to maintain homeostasis and it would chop up your DNA and your RNA. It would destroy everything. It, I, I kind of call this the four horsemen of the apocalypse because once these are released and they do get released to destroy your cells in some instances, we'll talk about why, but that's really nasty. So you want to keep those bound so that they have, they only function inside the lysosome, not all around the whole cell. You want to provide a localized environment. We talked about the pH thing. And then you want specific reactions to be in that place, right? Like if you're in a, you know, if you're making Pepsi in one factory and Coke in another, you don't want to just mix them all together because they're different ingredients. All right, so let's go through these organelles. Uh, we have the nucleus first. The nucleus is membrane bound. That means it has a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, it contains the DNA and it has a double membrane. So it actually has, if we were to look at the nucleus, it actually has one membrane and then it has another membrane outside of it, which it actually shares with the Golgi. I'm sorry, not the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulum. So it's kind of like this. 
and so this would be the endoplasmic reticulum and then this would be the nucleus and you can kind of see that here so you see the endoplasmic reticulum is sharing that outer membrane with the nucleus and then right here there's another one inside of it and it has what we call nuclear pores which are shown here these are gated it's like a gated community so it only allows certain things in or out and and so it, it wouldn't let dna inside the nucleus but it might let uh DNA polymerase, which is an enzyme that we talked about that needs to copy DNA, uh, it would let it inside because you need to copy the DNA inside there. So these uh, nuclear pores only allow certain things to go in and out. They're what we call gated channels. Um, the nucleus holds its shape. Uh, this membrane is only one ten thousand the thickness of a sheet of notebook paper. So there's scaff scaffolding in here. It's actually made out of keratin, which is the same thing that makes up your hair and your fingernails. And that's what gives the nucleus its shape. And we call that the nuclear lamina. So they're proteins, and I told you this is keratin, uh, that stabilizes the nucleus and then we talked about nuclear pores right they leg regulate the traffic into and out of the nucleus and then this is the rough er it's rough because it has these bumps on it um and we'll talk about what those are in a second this is an electron microscope of these nuclear pores um and then this is an electron microscope of the nuclear lamina. What kind of microscope do you think took this? The scanning or transmitting? This one may be easier to tell. It's inside, so it's the... Yeah, so it's transmitting, good. All right. So in the nucleus is the DNA, remember it's a double helix and we have letters of that, um, you know, it's made up of a phosphate. I'm not gonna draw the whole phosphate out. Even you guys can look at the phosphate functional group. It has oxygens attached to it. And then that's attached to a sugar, right? And that sugar is either ribose or deoxyribose. So if it's ribose, it's RNA. If it's deoxyribose, it's DNA. And then that's attached to a base. And we learned about the bases in chapter five. So the bases can be A or G or C or T. And in RNA, we also have U. Uh, this is an RNA. Uh, in DNA, it's T. So U replaces T in RNA. So if I had an A here, it would, we would have a T on the other side. And if this were a G, then we'd have a C on the other side and so on. So that would just be the DNA. And remember hydrogen bonds hold these together. And hopefully you know what hydrogen bonds are from chapter two and three. Uh, and so that holds the double helix together. But in order to package that 3.15 billion letters, uh, we have to wind this around something. So um, just to sort of give a real world example, what, whenever, whenever I was a kid and I know I'm dating myself, we didn't, we, the only video games we had were like Pong. So we spent a lot of time outside. We didn't have cell phones, any of the stuff like that. And, and we did a lot of, you know, kick the can and flying kites and making, uh, tennis ball launchers and stuff like that. And the thing that we did most, and I grew up in Houston, is we'd fly kites. So we'd fly kite. And the fun thing to do at the time was to see how long you could fly that kite. So we would go to the store and we would buy, you know, maybe 20 spools of kite string. And you guys have probably seen kite string, right? It comes on a spool and it's wrapped around there. And so 
this this would be you know hundreds of feet long. I think we the longest we ever got it was five thousand feet. And then you know my father would come home, and then my mom would call us in, and, and you know, and, and say, "Hey, we're we're gonna have dinner in ten minutes." Do you know how long it takes to we wrap up a mile of kite string? It takes forever, and so what we would do is we just started pulling it in, and pulling it, pull, 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 pull and it made this big giant. The bird's nest of kite string, and then we throw it in the garage. And do you think that that took up more or less space than the original 20 spools of kite string? More. Yeah. So, in order to get, so we, so my analogy here is that the DNA is the kite string. And in order to package DNA inside this nucleus, we need spools. Uh, to wrap the DNA around. And those spools are made up of proteins called histones, and they literally look just like this. And the histones, there's there's eight of them put together, and they, and they literally are a spool, and the DNA is wrapped around it just like a kite string. And that's the only way that you can package all of this genetic information inside your cells. So the when you think of chromosomes, and it, you probably see images of chromosomes, you know, the typical X shape, um, that isn't just DNA. Those chromosomes are the DNA plus the kite spools plus those histone proteins. And and that's because the DNA is always attached to those proteins. And that's what makes chromosomes. So, and I talked a little bit about why they were named that because the proteins stain blue when you use something called methylene blue on them. And some scientists added it and only the, only the histone stained, which looked like the DNA too, and they said, look at the colored parts. And that's where chromosome color part came from. So short pieces of chromosomes, these are the big ones, right? You have 23 uh, pairs, 23 you got from your mom, 23 you got from your dad. So 46 total chromosomes. Uh, and on those, uh, there's 3.15 billion letters split between them some are longer and some are shorter um and so the if we just looked at a small section of a chromosome we would call that chromatin so that's just a vocab word that you need to know so chromatin makes chromosomes and remember chromosomes are the dna plus the proteins histones um together and each species organism has uh, its own number of chromosomes. So in humans, we have 46, 23 pairs, one you got from dad, one you got from mom. So 23 of your chromosomes you got from your mom, 23 from your dad, together they make 46. Chimpanzees have 48 chromosomes, so they have 24 pairs. Fruit flies have eight, elephants have 56, Woolly mammoths have 58. This, uh, so I told you guys about uh, the Soviet scientist and Japanese scientists that want to take the DNA out of a woolly mammoth. And I think this just came up again in the news. The, they found some super intact DNA from a woolly mammoth that they excavated in Siberia or something. And what they want to do is they want to take the DNA out of the woolly mammoth cell, like a skin cell, and they want to take a fertilized elephant egg and extract the DNA out of that and then put the woolly mammoth DNA in. And then, you know, we talked about how the Raelians have a machine to jumpstart the cell division again. And that's how we do cloning. So they want to basically clone a woolly mammoth using an elephant. And they have to do it this way because all cells come from other cells, right? So the 
this may be a problem because they have a chromosome difference and that might make it a lot more difficult than if elephants and woolly mammoths had the same number of chromosomes. Uh, and we'll talk more about this in chapter 12, why that is. But uh, anyway, that that you might not get to see woolly mammoths running around your local zoo for a little while until they figure out how to deal with this. Wheat has 56, uh, pineapples have 60. Uh, so anyway, what the point that I want, I don't want you to memorize this, that you should know humans for sure. And this is a tool song, uh, 40, it's called 46 and two, and it's talking about the next step of evolution of humans would be to add chromosomes and we know that that would make us chimpanzees. So the, the point of this is, is that if you have more chromosomes, does that make you more complex? No. I'm pretty sure that I'm more complex than a pineapple. I'm just saying. Then might, some people might disagree, but. Probably more efficient. <laughs> but. The, the number of chromosomes have nothing to do with how complex an organism is. And, and that's the takeaway message here. So you don't need to memorize this. You just need to know that they're pairs, right? Uh, in animals, generally, in plants. And uh, humans have 46, 23 pairs. And they're made uh, of chromatin, which makes chromosomes, and that's made of DNA and proteins. All right, the nucleolus. It's so this is the nucleus, and inside the nucleus is a dark spot, and that's almost in every organism. When you stain it, you'll see it. This again, this is an artist drawing of a nucleus, and here's the nuclear pores. And inside the nucleus is a dark space. Well, this is where ribosomal RNA is made. This is part of the ribosomes that they make proteins. So these are the most important things inside the cell because without them, you wouldn't be what you are. You'd be dead. So the it's dark because there's so much activity making this, this ribosomal RNA to make proteins that you can literally see it with a, a light microscope. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, so you just should say that, no, the nucleolus is where ribosomal RNA is synthesized. And it's a dark spot in the nucleus. All right, so, ribosomal, so ribosomes are made up of RNA, ribosomal RNA plus proteins and I'll explain more about this when we get to chapter 17. But just, just for now, you should know that ribosomes are RNA and protein, and they are they make proteins from messenger RNA, which we talked about in chapter uh, five. So there's two types. We have free ribosomes. And if we look at a cell, we have a nucleus, and then we have the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm just trying to draw it really quick. And on here, we have the rough ER. That has ribosomes on it. We also have ribosomes just floating around in the cytoplasm. So there's two places that we would say that we find ribosomes. They would be free. So they're free, like they're just floating around in the ocean of the cytoplasm or they could be bound. And if they're bound, they're bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. That's what makes it look rough. So it's showing you that the ribosomes are here bound to the ER or they can be free. This is the ER membrane. So the ones that are attached to that are bound and the ones that aren't are free. Easy enough. And there's a reason for that. And we're gonna talk about that. But it has to do with the fact that either these proteins are going to be kept in the cell or they're going to be exported. 
So think about um, think about your saliva, right? So what do you think makes your saliva? What do you think makes anything in you? It's made of cells. So these cells line your salivary glands in your mouth. And, you know, you, you if you take 182, you'll probably dissect some salivary glands or be able to look at them under the microscope. These cells make things that are found in your saliva. One of those things is that amylase, which is the enzyme we talked about, that breaks down amylose which you guys more commonly would call starch or carbs. So when you put a Lay's potato chip in your mouth, this enzyme is present. Do you think that that en enzyme is in a cell or outside of a cell in your saliva? Let's take a guess. It's not a outside so it could yeah. work. right it wouldn't work if it was inside your cell it goes into your salivary glands and then that excretes the liquid we call saliva into your mouth so the cells make it they export it in order to export it it has to go through the endoplasmic reticulum it can't be made on free ribosomes so anything that is exported is made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and anything that's kept in the cell is made on free ribosomes. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain how that works in another lecture, but that's pretty much the, the take on ribosomes. So their, their job is to make proteins that are gonna be kept in the cell to do jobs or exported from the cell to do jobs. And then we'll pick up on this endomembrane system uh, on Thursday. You guys have any questions? No. no. Thank you. All right. Uh, good luck on your test if you haven't taken it already. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be at office hours tomorrow too. And I'm going to jump over there right now. So if you have any questions, you can do that too. All right. Have a good one. Thank you.